Uh, I'm just going to get right into it. I don't want to uh, start listing off the accomplishments of everyone on this panel because we'll be here all afternoon. Uh, but I would like to paint a, a brief picture of, of what the Cuban private sector is at the moment and uh, set the stage. So what we've, we've seen in the last few years is a very wonderful story, the, the growth of a nascent Cuban private sector. Uh, this, this is a result of, of Cuban government regulations which have helped uh, spur the, the entrepreneurial spirit of the Cuban people. Uh, what's also been uh, pr propelled the private sector forward is the, the corresponding U.S. regulations which have also helped uh, unlock some of the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, what we're seeing is, is private sector growth across various sectors, uh, whether it's uh, the restaurants, uh, paladares, which are private restaurants, which are just as good as, as any restaurant anywhere else in the world, uh, telecommunications, hospitality, agriculture, te technology. Uh, entrepreneurship is all over the place. So you know, what I'd like to do is give you a couple of, uh, of facts, call some data, uh, just to set the stage. Uh, Cuba's a, a nation of 12 million people. Uh, out of those 12 million, 5.1 uh, are in the labor force. Now out of those, 1.7 uh, represent the private sector. So that's uh, one third of, of, of workers are, are now in the private sector, which is remarkable given that 10 years ago there, there wasn't a, a, a private sector in Cuba. It was very small. Out of those, 500,000 are cuenta uh, propistas or licensed entrepreneurs. Uh, another 600,000 engage in uh, some sort of part time private sector work. And about 575,000 engage in uh, working cooperatives, which are, are uh, employee owned. Uh, enterprises. So what we're seeing is, is the, the Cuban individual really being able to begin to chart their economic future as well as play an important role in the future economic development of Cuba. And it's, uh, it's all very exciting and, and that being said we're, we're just going to jump right into it. So uh, let's start off with Tomas. Uh, we just heard in the last panel that uh, you know, there's been a lot, a lot of American travel to Cuba, a lot of uh, cultural exchanges and study abroad. How, how do you see that, you know, just American travel in general? impacting the Cuban economy and the entrepreneurs on the island. Yeah, thanks, Carlos. Well, first of all, unfortunately, the, the impact is limited, of course, we know, by U.S. sanctions. So the continued prohibition of tourism or travel for any purpose that is not in the 12 categories of approved travel is still prohibited, and that's, of course, the most limiting uh, element of U.S. travel to Cuba. And, of course, in addition to that, the U.S. embargo continues to impose uh, economic hardship uh, on the Cuban people. But for the now almost half a million Americans who are traveling to Cuba, majority of those actually of Cuban origin, um, they have an important impact in Cuba. And one of the and various reasons, whether it's reconciliation, whether it's helping fuel the nascent uh, private sector, uh, but of course their economic impact is, is also important. Cuba received last year three and a half million tourists, or travelers I should say, uh, which was a record. Uh, I think prior to that, the record was uh, hovering around the 2 million. Last year, they hit 3.5. And of course, we've heard that this year, tourism's up 17% in general, but 94%, I believe, the ambassador said, uh, for Americans. So the um, economic impact of that 3.5 billion travelers last, uh, sorry, of that uh, 3.5 million travels last year was around almost $3 billion. And that, along with, um, services represents an important chunk, about 12.7 billion of uh, Cuba's economy and export of services, which helps make up for an important trade gap. And so as Cuba is facing the prospect of only 2% economic growth versus 4% last year, and has really prioritized economic growth investment, uh, U.S. travel together with travel from the rest of the world uh, continues to be an important part uh, of the economy, yet one that's still um, uh, the, the impact of which is obviously hindered by the continuation of, of uh, U.S. sanctions. Right, great. Thank you. I would, I would actually like to add to that. I'm the CEO of a science and tech company out of um, Southern California, and I've been going to Cuba since 2004. Uh, first it was uh, for the opening of St. Uh, Nicholas, which is a, a Greek Orthodox church. And so that's how my uh, a journey started with Cuba. So too, when you, um, uh, right now when we talk about cultural tourism, 
uh, and everything. I, I think it's important uh, to uh, the emerging class, but you do have Fortune 500 companies or four, uh, 50 companies coming in and, uh, and, and getting OFAC licenses, and I think that there's a responsibility on us, whether we're an SME such as myself, or the bigger companies to really incorporate and bring the uh, emerging cl uh, class along. There's a lot of opportunities for that, uh, especially in the Afro-Cuban community and uh, with uh, the emerging Cuban women entrepreneurs. Well, that, that's a great point. That segues right into my next question, which was for you. Uh, you know, I know you've been doing a lot of very interesting work in Cuba, uh, empower, helping to empower and train and, and, and really move along the private sector uh, private sector activity within minority groups such as Afro-Cubans mm -hmm. or, uh, or women. Could you tell us a little bit about their role in, in the Cuban private sector? Right, no, they're, I, I have to tell you, I'm real, I'm, I've been very inspired and uh, they're, uh, uh, the gamut is across the board in terms of some are, uh, you know, just like here, very savvy and very capitalistic, for lack of a better word, and then there's, uh, you know, others that there's, uh, you know, that would benefit through uh, mentoring and, and training, and that's one thing that I've and we've taken on as an organization. And I strongly feel that whether you're going, you're, you haven't been to Cuba and you're, you're planning on going, or you've been many times, we have a responsibility during this engagement process uh, uh, and to be uh, respectful and to honor uh, their long, rich, deep history and culture, as well as protect and be uh, their IP because they are uh, exceptional. They've done uh, because of their, one of the reasons is because of their commitment both to healthcare and education, and we have to respect that. That's, a, that's a amazing work you're, you're doing. Uh, now, Dr. Feinberg, you are one of the most you know, foremost experts on, on business in Cuba, the private sector. I, I, I want to give a plug to your most recent book. There, there's copies for sale around the room. And you, Thank you, my good friend. <laughs> uh, I get my cut, too. There may not be uh, many left, so they have to hurry before they run That's out. right. No, they're a very popular book. It's called Open for Business, Building the New Cuban Economy. Uh, certainly check it out. But what I'd like to ask you is, is uh, could you paint a picture of what the private sector looks like right now? And where you sure. see it going. Okay, happy to do that. So, uh, as, well, as you mentioned at the outset, uh, it's often said that there are about a million people in the private sector, which would be 20%, sort of official numbers. But that doesn't include uh, all the Cubans who work for the government during the day and then moonlight at night in one form or another. Uh, nor does it include those people who have chosen basically to remain in the informal sector so they don't have to pay taxes. Uh, so if you add it all up, actually, you do get close to the number you threw out there, which was about two million people with at least one foot in the private sector, which would be 40% of working age Cubans. That's huge. That suggests that there's a lot, the transition has moved a lot, more, a lot further than uh, one might imagine uh, otherwise. Uh, most of these people start small, uh, and the Cuban government is still ambivalent. The Cuban government still says they don't want to see large-scale private accumulation. They don't want rich bourgeois. That's their official position. But what's the goal of every small and medium-sized businessman? To become a medium and large-scale businessman. That's inevitable, right? And so you already see that happening today. And uh, I'm sure I know people who started off with one, renting out one or two rooms, and now they're renting out four or five rooms. Well, they started out with uh, a small restaurant, and it is now a big restaurant. And by the way, their brother has a second restaurant. So we are beginning to see capital accumulation. And, and as the diaspora sees that, and as other foreigners see that, they are putting their money into these ventures. Uh, I think at, at the outset, there was some fear this might be reversed, as it had been in the 90s. I think that probability uh, is very low at this point. Irreversibility, the ambassador referred to irreversibility with regard to US-Cuba relations. Well, the irreversibility of US-Cuban relations implies the irreversibility of continuing economic reform within Cuba. So I don't see them going back. They might, you know, here and there, scale back on specific regulations, but the idea of reversing the whole privatization process, not going to happen. Well, you mentioned the, the Cuban government regulations. Uh, what are these? What were some of these changes? So, on the so in the last several years, on the positive side, uh, the Cuban government, you know, has expanded the list of activities you're allowed to engage in in the private sector. Uh, they've, they've altered the taxes, so they weren't quite so bad. 
Uh, they've allowed you to hire people other than your families. Uh, so a number of rules were relaxed. But there are still some tough regulations there. Uh, there's still a tax system, which if people reported their income properly, would be very burdensome. Uh, but there's a lot of underreporting because nothing is computerized. There's advantages, you know, to not having computers <laughs> uh, when it comes to reporting your, your revenue stream. Uh, some of the auditors can be harsh. I mean, one hears stories of excessive uh, auditing. Uh, there are uh, formal limits. If you have a restaurant, still 50 seats. Uh, you can own houses and homes, but only one or two. Uh, so there are still caps basically meant to prohibit capital accumulation on, on a large scale. And perhaps the major uh, limitation on private sector activity is that middle class professions, uh, if you're an architect, a lawyer, a doctor, basically you still need to work for the state. You can't just put up your placard and say, I'm a private entrepreneur. Uh, I will go so far as to make a prediction here. I think in the next five years we'll see further relaxation of that, more opening, uh, because the middle class is demanding in Cuba. Uh, the middle class, which after all have the capacity to leave the island now if they want, and they are, if you want to keep those people at home, you're going to have to give them more opportunity. No, that, that's, uh, that's, does anyone else want to add to this? this uh... Well, I would, just, I would just add that it makes perfect sense. The Cuban government has made huge uh, investment in human capital, both through free education, free health care, a number of other uh, investment in sports and, 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 and other cultural um, activities. And um, I think that it's becoming increasingly obvious that the return on that um, investment in human capital has been stunted by the restrictive atmosphere of some of the regulations on entrepreneurship. Um, what Richards mentions, for example, the inability of people in the professional sector, whether you're lawyers, accountants, et cetera, um, but there are also folks in the tech sector who are operating businesses on the skirt of what's allowed by that, by that, uh, by that license. And so a, uh, an exclusive versus an inclusive list would make sense. And what I mean by that is right now there's 201 categories of authorized employment. I think perhaps it would make more sense to have a list of prohibited areas where people aren't allowed to form their own businesses. And that way you actually provide a better environment for innovation. And you mentioned tech, and, and tech is, we're, we'll, shortly we'll be hearing from a, a tech entrepreneur from Cuba, and tech is obviously very exciting, a very exciting sector here in the U.S., all over the world, including Cuba. But wh where else are we seeing entrepreneurial uh, growth? What, what other markets and industries are, are Cubans uh, jumping into? Uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying, uh, oh, I'll give you a great, ex I'll give you an example. Um, I was there a few months ago, actually it was during, I was uh, there during President Obama's historical visit and I was working with the Office of Global uh, Engagement there and during that trip I had arrived a couple of days early to connect with some of the women entrepreneurs and I had set up a meeting for this uh, woman, Iris, and she has these beautiful paper products that are uh, made in Cuba. So we were talking to uh, a manager of a hotel and, um, and, and, and showcasing uh, what she had. And I, I think, uh, you know, sh she has these products, very unique, but yet there's this, still this mindset. Uh, the manager asked her, well, why would you want to pay taxes? You know, you're going to pay a huge amount of taxes, but also knowing her story and what her family has done, um, you know, she had no problem paying the taxes. She just wanted to enter the market and, and, and provide this. So uh, beautiful paper goods, uh, that, that's one of the things I've seen. I would say in general, what I would refer to as the tourism cluster. You know, there was this idea that tourists would go down there and they would stay at government hotels and all the money would go to the government. That, complete, that analysis completely failed to understand the way tourism has actually developed. Uh, some, there is now some 22,000 and rapidly growing rooms in people's private homes or even their entire home that are now rented out to tourists. That's a, that's a third or more of the total number of rooms available and an even higher percentage uh, in, in the major tourist centers like Havana. They can't build hotels fast enough to accumulate, to accommodate uh, the rapid rush of tourists. Uh, then when they remodel their homes, uh, who's doing the remodeling? Who are the construction workers? private sector for the most part. When they want to buy furniture, where do they get that from? Private furniture manufacturers. Where they want to get food to put on the table for their guests, uh, that often comes from private markets. So there's a, and then of course, transportation, 
uh, and most importantly, the restaurants to make up the full, uh, what I call the tourism cluster. And since this conference is on culture, I would argue if you go to some of the nicer restaurants in Havana, we are seeing culinary culture. Culture in many senses of the word. The food itself is artistic. There's often art on the walls, of some of it quite avant-garde art, some of it nostalgic art, what was Havana like in the 1940s and 50s. So there are all types of themed restaurants, which are themselves purveyors of culture. So I think uh, the, the, the restaurant scene in Havana is really, is really very exciting. That, that's fascinating. So we're seeing this growth. Uh, my, you know, one question and one, one issue that's faced really by any entrepreneur and anyone in the world is, is where do you, how do you finance your business? Where, where are Cuban entrepreneurs uh, accessing capital? So from? the financing, all right, so, and here's an area where the private sector is still quite restricted. All the banks in Cuba are completely state-owned banks, and basically what they have done is lend to state-owned enterprises, all an inside game. They're simply not accustomed to lending to, to small and medium-sized private sector firms. Uh, they don't even know how to put together the projects and the paperwork, et cetera. So that's a big constraint. Uh, now, that may be somewhat alleviated uh, looking forward. The, uh, the, the documents that were just put out, these planning vision, and vision documents that are now being debated, would give the private sector in Cuba a, a new and better legal status. With that new legal status, and this may take a couple of years, it would be easier for them to access the state-owned bank. So that would help. But in the meantime, where's the money coming from? Basically, two sources. The diaspora, friends and relatives abroad, as an American, formally speaking, you're not allowed to invest in Cuba, but you can give people money, and now you can lend them money. And that's happening. Uh, and then the other source is, it's not the case that Cubans have no savings, which is often the myth. Uh, once there's an investment opportunity, you'd be amazed how the money can surface. They might have to sell a car. They might sell uh, a farm they have. Uh, uh, they may have saved money from travels abroad, you know, if, they're, if they've been a diplomat or a, or a soldier or a dancer or whatever. Uh, so they are able to put together the five or ten thousand uh, dollars that it typically costs to launch some of these private sector firms. I was just going to add that we have to also think about the impact of, that the new U.S. regulations have on the ability of these small businesses to grow. And I think one of the a good uh, case study referring to uh, the, the uh, bread and breakfasts or the Casa Particulares that Richard was referring to is the presence of Airbnb in Cuba, which when it launched uh, a little over a year ago, um, launched with 1,000 uh, subscribers. So 1,000 entrepreneurs who subscribe to uh, make their capacity available to the demand that Airbnb is able to bring from the United States on its online platform. Uh, it was one of the early movers into Cuba because it was uh, technology-based. It doesn't require building a huge infrastructure in Cuba, simply sw flipping a switch and allowing to connect the supply and the demand. But a year later, Airbnb had grown from 1,000 subscribers to 4,000 subscribers. They had had over 34,000 uh, visits. And the average booking fee or revenue per booking for a particular entrepreneur in Cuba was about 250 bucks. So someone probably staying five days at a Casa Particular, which is about somewhere about 10 times the uh, average monthly salary in Cuba. So you can see how a very simple regulation that was changed in the United States um, helped a lot, uh, connect U.S. demand with Cuban supply. The Cuban government already had a very robust regulatory system about the renting of rooms that made Airbnb's entry uh, much easier. And it also, of course, now creates uh, um, a, um, an environment where uh, US, uh, Cuban entrepreneurs are benefiting from uh, American online platform. And, and another, another, another way is uh, remittances, right? Uh, for example, there was an announcement was today uh, about Western Union. Yeah, so um, there's about, depending what statistics you look at, um, you have the Havana Consulting Group saying that U.S. Uh, remittances to Cuba are $4 billion a year. Then you have Manuel Orozco at the American Dialogue saying that they're about 1.5. So I usually say two and, and think I'm relatively safe in my estimates. Um, and this is money that's sent mainly by Cuban Americans, but it can now be from any American as long as it uh, um, conforms to the general licenses, to send money to friends or family uh, in, in Cuba. That $2 billion a year with a B is a significant cash infusion, especially to help fuel a lot of these uh, private entrepreneurs. In the past, 
the process by which you did this was cumbersome because the money remitter had to have a special license to be able to remit money. In order to send the money, you would have to go to one of these qualified remitters. Western Union is one of them, but if you went to Western Union in DC, they would tell you, I'm sorry, we're not qualified to send money to Cuba because we haven't had the specific training for this particular location. So you'd have to ask a friend in Miami to go to Western Union to send the money. As of yesterday, Western Union announced that you can now, on their platform, on their app, on your cell phone, send money directly to Cuba, so, you know, sign the affidavit electronically. And so as US policy evolves, as companies or entrepreneurs are finding ways to use technology to get away around some of these roadblocks, we're finding easier and faster ways to get um, resources uh, to Cuba. And then my, uh, my sort of concern with that is because the Cubans that did leave uh, after the revolution, uh, they pr predominantly were not Afro-Cubans. So one of the outcomes of uh, d the announcements and, uh, of, the, uh, of President Obama's is that uh, they have been, the, Cube, the island has been receiving such an increase in these remittances. However, the Afro-Cuban community has not had access to those opportunities. And I think the best way to deal with that would be to have a banking system. Now you have to rely on your fr friends and family, so that's of course uh, in a, in unequal. Uh, but if you had a banking system in Cuba, and if you had a good project, irrespective of your background, a good project, you'd go to the banker and get some money, right? So I think the way to, the way to respond to this, the equity issue in finance is an open banking system. Now, the Cuban banks do offer loans to Cuban entrepreneurs. The problem is, of course, one, there's distrust because Cubans don't have a debt mentality, or they also don't want to show their full books to the Cuban banker who would then make an assessment of the risk of the loan. Uh, and also the amount of the loan that is, that is offered if you're, self, if you're a, a cuenta propista or self-employed versus being a cooperative that actually has a legal entity is somewhat limited. So you'll hear from a Cuban tech entrepreneur, I believe in the next panel, who um, is a recipient of one of these loans, but the, I think the loan was 500 or $800, which of course, uh, is not great, but they took the loan nonetheless to build a credit relationship with the bank. And so while it exists, there's a number of reasons why it hasn't realized its full potential. V very incipient. There have been some international um, microenterprise lenders who have knocked at the door and said, you know, we would like to enter this market. Mm -hmm. And at least to my knowledge so far, they have not succeeded in getting approval. But that will eventually happen. And that would be one response mm -hmm. to the unequal availability of remittances. Great. Uh, if we have no one else has anything to add, I think we'd like to open it up to, to the audience. I know they're dying to ask questions of, of you. I'm going to run right here. I think there, we have microphones oh. somewhere, so if we can hear you better. Hi, <laughs> I'm Vicki Huddleston, and I'll be on one of the panels shortly. But it's really fascinating to listen to all of you. So I'm my question is a follow-up uh, question. If you're a small microfinance, and you want to lend to these small entrepreneurs in Cuba, uh, first of all, what do you need on the US side? Is that a specific license? And is it, how long does it take to get? And secondly, is it legal on the Cuban side? And uh, what kind of agreement would the Cuban government accept as a, a legitimate agreement? Yeah, so I can speak to that. Uh, Mitt Richard, maybe you can fill in. So on the U.S. side, there has been expressions of interests from NGOs. I know Axiom International, for example, there was the first micro lender in China and had a long relationship there in helping build China's micro lending system. Um, uh, and other organizations have been interested in doing this type of work in Cuba. People have been interested in rep replicating the Kiva model uh, in Cuba, which is the online uh, lending platform in s small amounts. Um, and on the U.S. side, there are ways to obtain a specific license in order to do that. And what we've seen in the last few years is that the administration has become not just proactive, but also very accepting and interested in receiving these types of applications. I believe some have been approved. The problem, of course, is, well, there's two. One is on the Cuban side. Cuba needs to decide that it wants to allow foreign NGOs op to operate in Cuba, especially in something as sensitive as the financial sector. Uh, and then also, of course, which we don't have time to discuss on this panel, but there's much larger problems stemming from 
the risk calculation U.S. banks make when transacting even approved transactions, um, which creates problems for foreign investors in Cuba. The bottom line is, if you're a bank, are you really going to risk your entire asset portfolio to a multi-billion dollar uh, uh, OFAC fine in order for the $50,000 you're going to make of all, you know, 100 different transactions over the, over the course of the year? So, so, so there, yeah, problems on the US side. But on the Cuban side, in the broad sense, Cuba is a capital short country, dramatically capital short. Essentially, they have to reconstruct their entire capital plant. They don't have the money to do it. They've got to come to terms with the fact they're going to have to let in much more foreign investment than they have up to date. The, the, the Minister of uh, Foreign Trade and Investment says he wants $2.5 billion a year in foreign investment. That's closer to what they need. They cannot approve them at, 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 that, at that, they haven't been able to approve projects at that speed. They need to open up to international banking, they need to open up to uh, the, the international financial institutions, the IMF, World Bank, IDB, all of whom, by the way, have micro-enterprise programs well established. Uh, these are decisions that the Cuban government will have to confront over the next several years. And not to beat a dead horse, but even if a lot of those things were done, the threat of U.S. sanctions or the compliance cost to banks make it such that even authorized transactions, even transactions that are authorized under general license, for which the remitter even has a specific license, still encounter problems with bank compliance because they simply don't want to take the risk of transacting the money and exposing themselves to, to huge fines. So, so Tomas, do I understand correctly that you plan to open up a bank yourself, the, the Tomas <laughs> Bank, to, to handle this? So Bilbao. don't think I haven't, <laughs> it's called Banco Bilbao de Vizcaya. <laughs> so don't think I haven't thought about it, but the interesting thing about this is that there are actually models, for example, Western Union. The reason Western Union is able to move uh, and has been, had a presence in Cuba for so long is because of its business model, right? It's a heavy compliance, high volume, small transaction bank. It doesn't hold assets, it doesn't buy and sell real estate assets or other, or, you know, or other things. So, so because it has a heavy compliance investment, it's able to do these things. A large bank doesn't have the right business model to accept that type of, uh, that type of risk. So, Western Union so also charges a very high fee. It does, as though it's less than jumping on a flight and hand delivering the money. But the, for the, the fee is somewhere between 7%, 10% Whoa. Um, oh. for some of these. That hurts. <laughs> but they have a presence everywhere in Cuba, right? So if you wanted to get money to some place north of Baracoa, you could get there with Western Union. Speaking of banking, uh, Stonegate Bank out of Florida recently announced that you, know, you can use their debit cards in Cuba. Could you talk a little bit about that and the cash component of traveling to Cuba? And, uh... Yeah, sure. So there's a couple of problems, and again, it goes back to this financial sector problem, is even institutions that have said they will uh, allow their credit cards to be used in Cuba, let's say MasterCard, for example, run into the problem that MasterCard doesn't own your credit card. Your bank owns your credit card. And therefore, even if MasterCard says that they're willing to, to, to process the transactions, the bank that issued you the card doesn't want to expose itself to OFAC sanctions because it can't verify that each transaction complies with US law. So even in cases where certain things have been authorized again, there's still the overhanging threat of US sanctions and US um, uh, uh, fines to financial institutions. So what happens, is, of course, is that most people who travel to Cuba will take cash as opposed to using their credit cards. And that is limiting because if, if you're traveling to Cuba, you have to come up with a budget of how much you're going to spend in Cuba and say you say $3,000, you go down there, you pay your rental car, you pay your hotel, you're left with, I don't know, 800 bucks, and you see this wonderful piece of art, this sculpture that someone made that you just have to have that costs $1,500. Well, your options are now calling your wife to tell her to send you a remittance through Western Union, pay the 7%, go to the place, pick it up, which is not likely something that you're going to do. If you could use your credit card, then, and I'm sure entrepreneurs would quickly adopt that, then you create a, a, a system where American travelers can have a much greater economic impact on the ground. Yeah. Right. Question? Well, I, I want to make a couple of comments actually regarding all this. Um, one thing is, in terms of the visual arts and purchasing art, the artists have worked this out so that if you get, because $1,500 for the major Cuban artist would get you very little, because the major Cuban artists are selling in the 
take the work with them, but mm -hmm. they pay a bank account in Spain because mm -hmm. all the right. Cuban artists have accounts right. outside of the country. But also, I imagine you might be aware of this, that in Miami, there are sort of entrepreneurs, if you will. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's on. They're legal entrepreneurs or not, where if you want to invest in Cuba, because there are people that are trying to invest, particularly for helping people build small hotels, for example, that you give the money in US dollars to someone in Miami and their counterpart in Cuba gives the cash to someone. So there is no transaction fee. There's no transaction that really happens. You're just giving money to someone in Miami and someone in Cuba. Is Could I actually uh, 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 provide some feedback regarding that? Sure. Because I don't know the regulations and everything. And I know at Mission Critical Technologies, we have a compliance officer and our legal team. I think it's really important as we're building a relationship and we're trying to build trust that it's transparent, too. On, and so that's what I would add to that. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And thank you, Meridian, for hosting this distinguished panel. We wish we could stay a little longer, but our time's up. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you.